Okay, so the second talk of the session is going to be about trace inequalities and given by David Suter. Thanks. Okay, let me start um, with a motivation why we actually should care about trace inequalities. And okay, we are all like, interested in, in quantum mechanics or quantum physics. And in my opinion, the main difference between like classical physics and, and quantum physics are like um, the two features like complementarity and entanglement. So whereas entanglement is not really an issue in this talk, um, this talk is more about the complementarity aspect. And so, okay, what does it mean? So we all know, so if you have two observables, then it might not be the case that they are simultaneously measurable. Or in other words, if you have like observables, then if you view them as matrices, then these matrices do not need to commute necessarily. And oftentimes, like if you have um, certain situations or scenarios that we understand very well in, in classical physics, um, it can happen that these things are difficult to prove or maybe not understood at all for quantum mechanics. And as I said, oftentimes this has to do with this fact that um, the matrices or our density matrices or whatever, um, they do not commute, unlike in the classical case. And so one can state that it is important to have a good understanding about quantum mechanics. We need to have tools to somehow get a feeling or handling about how to understand functions of matrices where the matrices do not commute. And oftentimes these kind of things, they complicate our life a lot if you want to prove something for, for a quantum scenario that we already know in a classical scenario. And here trace inequalities offer such a tool that sometimes can be helpful. And there's a second point that trace inequalities are also from a purely mathematical point of view, I think very neat and nice. And oftentimes um, they are helpful um, for proving other things. So let me maybe start with the probably best known trace inequality. This is the so-called Golden Thompson inequality that was proven in the 60s independently of Golden and Thompson. And so what does it say? So it somehow tries to relate. So we have two Hermitian matrices and it somehow tries to relate the exponential of the sum of these two matrices with the individual exponentials. So if these matrices would be numbers, then of course we all know the exponential of a sum of two numbers is the same as the product of the individual exponentials. But for matrices, if the matrices do not commute, then this is not the case. However, there's this beautiful relation here that tells us if you put a trace around the two objects, then they are ordered in this way that you can see. And so as I said, this was proven by Golden and Thompson. And why did they prove that? So they were working on statistical physics, I think, and they wanted to upper bound the partition function. And they are like sums of or exponentials with sums inside show up. And they noticed that such an inequality would do the job. So they tried to prove it and they, they managed to do so. Um, if you look at this inequality and if you haven't seen it before, then you could maybe start trying to prove it. It's not horribly complicated, but it's also not so easy um, to, to prove this, this simple inequality or simple looking inequality. And in my opinion, the reason why it's so well known today is because it has many or turned out to be useful in many different areas. For example, um, if you consider random matrix theory, for example, if you want to derive, let's say, a Chernoff bound for sums of independent random variables, then if you inspire yourself by the technique how this is done for random variables and not random matrices, then you see that there also you would like to somehow relate an exponential with a sum inside to the individual exponentials and then use the fact that these matrices or random variables that they are usually assumed to be independent. And so for example, Andreas Winter and his, his supervisor, they noticed that here also Golden Thompson is very helpful. And uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, the first Chernoff bound for matrices was derived also from Andreas using this Golden Thompson inequality. Or another um, application or situation where Golden Thompson turns out to be very useful is um, to prove entropy inequality. So this talk will focus more on these things. So um, for example, the strong subadditivity inequality proven by Lieb and Oskar in the 70s, they are also the key insight or the key step in, in their proof was an extension, a slight extension of this Golden Thompson inequality. So we will hear more about that in this. And also in other fields, like I would say almost everywhere where matrix exponentials show up, this golden Thompson inequality is potentially useful. And maybe the last point I would like to make here is that it's not so clear how you would extend it to more than two matrices. Okay, what do I mean by that? 
here's Golden Thompson again at the top. So if you would now guess how could it look like for three matrices, then I would say the left hand side is so rather obvious how we would like to have it. So it should be also an exponential and then a sum of just three matrices inside. And the right hand side then is not so clear anymore. So the most naive guess would be that you just add another factor e to the h3. But this is, of course, totally wrong. So this, this doesn't make sense at all. For example, the left hand side is like a real number or even a positive number. And the right hand side could be even a complex number. So you, you, you're comparing two things you should not compare. So this doesn't make sense at all. So you could make maybe a bit more sophisticated guess. You, you would symmetrize the right hand side of the trace then at least you would compare two real numbers. But this is also, I mean, this is too, na too naive. So it's easy to find counterexamples that show us that this matrix inequality, the, the one at the bottom, is, is not correct either. So why do I'm telling you this? That, um, just to somehow emphasize that it's not clear how an extension would look like. But there exist extensions. So for example, um, in 73, Elliot Lee wrote uh, pretty remarkable paper, in my opinion, where he proved several nice theorems of facts. And I would say the key lay mine in this paper was the following um, inequality. This is in the blue box. Um, we call it today Leap's triple matrix inequality. And if you have a look at it, it's really an extension of the golden Thompson inequality to three matrices. So the left hand side is clear, I guess. And the right hand side is a bit more complicated, but it's also like it also has like these factors, these exponentials, e to the h1 and e to the h2 and e to the h3, right? But as I said, it's a bit more complicated. We have this integral representation and we have some inverses and, and things are a bit more complicated. But even if you now think, okay, this might look horrible or not, not really nice, it's very powerful and um, it can be used to, to derive a simple corollaries, powerful facts from it, from a today's perspective at least. For example, the famous strong subadditivity that you see in red there um, follows pretty easily from this triple matrix inequality. Also another fact that is maybe not that well known in our community is a concavity theorem that tells us that if you have the map that maps a positive definite matrix to the trace of the exponential of a Hermitian matrix plus the logarithm of this positive definite matrix, this function turns out to be concave. This is um, crucial in, in, for example, random matrix theory. It is also pretty deep. And again, it follows um, with a few lines from this triple matrix inequality. So um, this somehow leads to the question if there exists like extensions to more than three matrices. Because like the three matrix extension turns out to be very powerful already, so it would be nice to have extensions to more than three matrices. And um, I met once Elliot Lieb in a conference roughly one year ago, and there he also advertised this triple matrix inequality and emphasized that it's not understood or understood very well right now. For example, the Golden Thompson inequality at the top, and also, for example, strong subadditivity, we have a very good understanding. We have a whole bunch of alternative proofs, I think more than 20 for each of these statements. But for the triple matrix inequality, so far there was only one single proof, which was Lieb's original proof. And I quote him, this proof is, is rather complicated and I would, would agree with this fact. So I think the start of this, of, of this project that I present here was to see whether we can have a better understanding about this triple matrix inequality. And how we tried to do that is we went one step back again and asked ourselves whether we really understand Golden Thompson. And so I would like to do the same now with you. We, would like to go back to the Golden Thompson inequality and present a proof that at least I haven't seen so far. And this proof is, is rather intuitive, at least in my opinion. And once we understand this proof for the Golden Thompson inequality, then it's almost immediate how it can be extended to more than two matrices. And yes, so this is the, the plan, what we like to do. And then if there is time, we can speak about an application. So we derive new extensions of this Golden Thompson inequality. And as an application, we can improve the strong subadditivity relation. Then this also makes the connection to the talk that we saw just before um, by Mish. OK, so okay, what is the, the, the idea behind this, this proof of Golden Thompson that I would like to present? This is the following. So um, 
if you recall the inequality, then if the two matrices, if they would commute, then the inequality is trivial. It's even an equality. So the idea was, so this is a very vague question, but the idea was somehow, is there a technique or method around that allows us, if you have two matrices, to modify one of these two matrices such that it commutes with the other one, and at the same time, we, sh we should not change the matrix by too much. As I said, this is a vague question, but there exists a technique that is not new at all, but maybe it's not so well known in this community, and I think it deserves to be better known. And this technique is called pinching. Okay, there exist also different names, but I think pinching is a, is a good name. So, and what is it? So it's the following. So if you consider a positive definite matrix, A, then we can write down, of course, its spectral decomposition. We can write it as a sum over the eigenvalues times the projector that projects onto the eigenspace of this eigenvalue. And then we can define a completely positive and trace-preserving map that we call pinching map with respect to A, which is the map that you see here at the, at the bottom. So it's just we have an input, X, and this input gets mapped or gets sandwiched or multiplied from the, from the left and the right with these projectors, and then we sum over all projectors. So for the more physics-oriented people in the audience, this is like performing a measurement with respect to an observable A, right? And so this simple map here has a few um, not so deep but rather useful properties. So for example, the first one is, is essentially obvious. So if we have a matrix X and we pinch it with respect to A, then this pinched matrix, the output, commutes with A. This, again, this is not surprising. It's, the pinching is like removing the off-diagonals in the basis of A. As I said, it's like making a measurement. Uh, a second property is that if you have a multiplication of a, tra of a pinched matrix times the matrix with respect to which, to which we pinch, and we have a trace around this, then we can remove the pinching. So this has to do with the fact that the trace is cyclic. And last, there is a, an operator inequality that tells us, roughly speaking, that the pinched matrix is bigger than the not pinched matrix. Okay, we have here a normalization factor, so this is like one, a number that is like one over the number of distinct eigenvalues of A. And so all these properties, they are really easy to prove. I mean, this is one or maybe at most two lines, each of them, so we'll not prove them here. And as I said, the last one is an operator inequality. For those that are not familiar, you have to read it in this way. Okay, so now, once we have this pinching map with these three simple properties, we can try whether we can use it to prove Golden Tom's and with this question here at the top having in mind. So this is the idea. So here's Golden Thompson again. And maybe let me first reformulate it slightly. This is just to make notation simple. So we can, of course, write every Hermitian matrix as the logarithm of a positive definite matrix. It's not surprising. This is the same as that we can write a real number as the logarithm of a positive number, right? So therefore, we can make the substitution here and, and rewrite Golden Thompson in terms of positive matrices instead of Hermitian matrices. This is really nothing. And so here's Golden Thompson. So let's try to prove this. So this is the, the most important slide probably of the talk. Um, OK, we put a logarithm to the both sides to simplify again with notation. You will see this. And in the first step, we do now something that is not clear at all right now why this is useful to do. We lift the problem to high dimensions, or more precisely, we replace the matrices A1 and A2 by n-fold tensor products and renormalize everything, and then we know that there is an equality because the trace is known to be multiplicative under the tensor product. So as I said, this is not clear right now why this is a good start, but OK, we, did, we didn't do anything, essentially. Right? Um, and now here comes the important step. So now, um, as I said, the idea was to modify one of the two matrices such that they commute. And we know the pinching is now the tool that we can do this. So let's now take one of the two matrices and pinch it with respect to the other one. So we just take the matrix A2 and pinch it with respect to A1. And now we have to relate, I mean, we have to see what happens if we do that, right? So we know by this pinching inequality, this operator inequality, that the pinched matrix is bigger than the, the input matrix, right? 
So um, we also have like here this normalization. So this is a number. So maybe we take care about this number first. So this is a real number. So it commutes with everything. We can move it out of the logarithm and the exponential and the logarithm again. And we can use the simple fact that the number of distinct eigenvalues of an m-fold tensor product only grows polynomially in m. So this is something that is well known and not really deep. And for those that haven't seen it, you can just consider the case where we have a two-dimensional matrix with two distinct eigenvalues, and then already the two-fold tensor product has only three distinct eigenvalues. So in other words, already two eigenvalues come in pairs. If you do this more and more, then more and more eigenvalues will come in pairs. And what I want to say is that really the number of distinct eigenvalues is given by this binomial coefficient, and this is polynomial in M. So therefore, we have here this error term that grows like, like a, as the logarithm of a polynomial in M over M. So the logarithm comes from this logarithm here. Okay, so now, um, okay, let's come back to this inequality. So we have this pinching inequality that tells us that the pinched matrix is bigger than the input matrix, right? So we just need to make sure that um, the function is monotone in A2. And so this is the case because we know that the logarithm is operator monotone, this is well known, and also the trace of the exponential of a matrix, this function is also monotone, this follows by Leuvenos theorem, for example. And so then we justified this inequality here. Okay, again, this is the, the most important step. We'd we'll be more than happy if, if everyone takes this this slide back home. So if there's something unclear, maybe one should ask now. Okay, good. So now we introduce the pinching, and of course we did that because we know after pinching the matrix, the two commute, right? So now we use this, and we all know that the logarithm or the product, or the logarithm of a product of two matrices that commute is the same as the sum of the individual logarithms. So we can take these two logarithms together, and then the exponential here eats the logarithm, so we get what we have here. And now, okay, we have to think a bit and say, okay, we started with this term here, then we introduced the pinching, then things commute, so golden thompson is, is easy, and now we want to get rid of the pinching again, because the golden thompson inequality here, of course, has no pinchings um, inside. So therefore, we want to get rid of it, and we can do this with the second property. We have this property that if you have a, a product of these two matrices and the trace around them, then we can remove the pinching. Right? So we can remove it, and then we can use again the fact that the trace is is multiplicative under tensor product, and in the end we consider the limit where m goes to infinity, and then this error term here vanishes. And so we are done, right? And so why should this be now be intuitive? I mentioned it already a bit. I think it's intuitive because we had this idea that if we can modify one matrix such that the two commute, then Golden Thompson is, is trivial, right? And so the pinching inequality tells us that if we pinch the matrix, then they commute. And in addition, if we allow ourselves to lift the problem to high dimensions, then we do not harm the matrix too much by pinching it. And so this is something that um, occurs also in different branches, branches of mathematics. This is sometimes people refer to this as the tensor power trick or something. I don't fully understand it, but in some sense, if you lift the problem to high dimension, things become smooth. And in, in this case, the pinching does not really harm too much. So this error term here vanishes in the limit. Okay, and so now, once we understand this proof, it's also um, rather intuitive how we would extend this inequality to three matrices. So um, think about that we have now three matrices, then we could also pinch in an iterative way. We could first pinch, let's say, maybe A3 with A2, then take these two together, and then pinch this big matrix with A1, for example. And we can do this in an iterative way. Okay, a bit more precisely, um, to understand how this is done, we need a small fact that tells us that the pinching has another representation. So I define it as the sum over the projectors, but we can also write the pinching map as an average over unitaries. So this A to the IT, these are complex matrix exponentials and these are unit. So this is nothing deep, this fact. And now we can just follow the same lines that we saw for two matrices before, and we can prove the following inequality. Um, as you can see here, um, 
there are two unitaries that survive at age two. So this has to do with the fact, so we start exactly the same, so we can introduce the pinching for free because the pinching inequality goes in the right direction and then things commute so we can simplify everything and then we want to get rid of the pinching again and as it happens at the outside and at the inside we can do that but in the middle we cannot remove the pinching totally. And so therefore these unitaries here, they survive. And it's also good that they survive because otherwise the statement would be wrong, right? We, we've seen this in the, in the second slide. So we can do this now for arbitrarily many matrices, for example for four matrices it looks like this. And I think you, you see the structure. We always pick up some unitaries in the middle. Okay, so at that point, some of you might say, okay, this is maybe nice, but this supremum is ugly here. And we also thought so, and we were unhappy with the supremum. We, we preferred or we thought, okay, it would be much nicer if you could replace it by maybe an average that does not depend on the matrices. And so, um, first of all, when we started the project, we didn't even know how a three matrix or four matrix extension of the golden thompson inequality would look like. And the pinching helped us a lot because it's intuitive to see how an inequality would look like. And then we thought, okay, is there another tool around that we can, such that we can strengthen this inequality a bit, in, the, in this case, re removing the supremum. And there exists such a tool, which is in this case like complex interpolation theory, but I think I don't have time to go into detail. But the pinching gives you the right form, and then with complex interpolation theory, we can tighten up the result a bit. And so he, here is the, the main result. It's written a bit more generally. So we have an N matrix extension of Golden Thompson written here in Schatten P norms. So for P equals to one, it's the trace norm. For P to infinity, it's the operator norm. And you can see it's really a Golden Thompson type inequality. So we have like an exponential of a sum of Hermitian matrices that we link with the product of the individual exponentials. We have here these unitaries and the supremum has has gone now and we could replace it with an average with this beta zero distribution which is this um, distribution that is peaked around zero and it does not depend on the matrices just given by this simple form. Okay, this may be a bit hard to digest now so let me simplify it. We can consider again just three matrices for example and the Hilbert-Schmidt norm so P equals to two and then we see that this simplifies um, immediately to this inequality here, which turns out to be exactly the same as Leap's triple matrix inequality that we saw at the beginning. Right? So in other words, we, um, we now found an alternative proof for Leap's triple matrix inequality, and even more, we have a result that holds for arbitrarily many matrices and also um, Schatten P norms instead of only trace norms or traces. And as I said, I don't have time to go into the proof in detail, but as I said, it uses like um, some results from complex interpolation theory that got more and more attraction in this community by works of Salman Beghi, Fred Dupree, Mark Wilde, and, and others in, in, the last, in the last years. So maybe instead of presenting the proof, let me give you an application where we can make use of this new inequality. This has to do with this recoverability and, and strong subadditivity. Um, okay, we've heard already in this conference yesterday and okay, a little bit also just before that we can define a quantum Markov chain as the following. So if you have three systems, A, B, and C, and a, a density matrix on these systems, we call this density matrix a Markov chain if it is possible to recover the C system, suppose we lose it, if you can recover the full state, in particular the C system, by only acting on the B system. So this is this definition, that there exists a recovery map that really acts only on the B system, and we can reconstruct the full state. So then there's this result by Pates that tells us, okay, an alternative characterization of Markov chains is the set of states where the conditional mutual information between A and C given B vanishes. And even more, if this happens, then this recovery map, which is the PETS recovery map, always satisfies the equality in the definition. Right. Then there was this question, okay, what about now a robust version of this characterization? How to characterize states that have a conditional mutual information that is not zero but small? 
there was this result by Omo and Renato that tells us whenever this conditional mutual information here is small, so if this is small, then this fidelity here must be very large. So in other words, this equality here holds approximately. And so this inequality is nice for various reasons, as we have seen. For example, it also strengthens the strong subadditivity of LEAP. And OK, let me now make a connection to these trace inequalities. So trace inequalities usually are, are trivial if things commute. And so happens, again, with this inequality or also with the strong subadditivity. So let me briefly mention that. If you suppose for a moment that the matrices are classic, or the, the, the state is classical, all the, or the matrix and all its marginals are diagonal, then we can very easily rewrite the condition or the conditional mutual information as this relative entropy. So this is always possible. But then we have here this term exponential of a sum of logarithms. And if everything commutes, we can shift around terms as we want. And we can re rearrange it in these terms. So we get exactly this equality where this is this Pitts recovery map that we saw before. So, and if things do not commute, then this step, of course, totally breaks down. And this is the, the whole difficulty in proving strong subadditivity or also like strengthened versions of it. So because things do not commute, this step gets pretty difficult. And we also know from this simple analysis that like this fuzzy Raynor bound um, is at least in the commutative case where everything is classical and commutes, it is not tight because we know that minus 2 log fidelity is smaller than the relative entropy, right? And we know that in the classical case, um, there should be a relative entropy here. So this then um, led to the question, OK, can we prove a lower bound on the conditional mutual information that is tight in the classical case and also where the recovery map is known explicitly? So okay, as Misha mentioned, after this result by Omar and Renato, there was a series of results trying to improve it and generalize it, but this was discussed last year at QIP. Just want to mention here that the question to have a bound that is tight in the commutative case and, and where we have an explicit recovery map, this was still open. And this we can now do with the Golden Thompson extension. It's maybe also not a coincidence that the Golden Thompson extension works because Leap's original proof to prove gold, uh, strong subadditivity. He actually wanted to have a four matrix extension because in the conditional mutual information, we have four entropy terms. But he only had the three matrix extension at hand, so therefore he lost something. And now we can, we can tighten this up a bit. So let me, as a last slide, present um, a short proof sketch how this is possible. So, um, okay. The only additional thing you have to know is that there exists so-called variational formulas for the relative entropy. So this is a formula that tells us we can write the relative entropy as an optimization problem of this form here. And the same is true for this measured relative entropy, where we just apply a measurement. And so if you have this, we can now start with the conditional mutual information that we would like to lower bound. By definition, we can write it as a relative entropy with this slightly ugly term here. And then we write it in terms of this variation for, or we apply this variation formula. And why do we do that? We do that because then we see that this part here um, looks like a Golden Thompson type, or like a Golden Thompson term, right? Golden Thompson inequality tells us that we can upper bound this term here. If we apply, if we apply the new inequality for four matrices, if we can upper bound this one, and here's a minus, then we can lower bound everything. So we can write this exponential of sums of matrices as products. And as it happens, this is exactly a measured relative entropy if you apply this variational formula here. And then we can um, tighten up things a little bit. And as it happens, here there's exactly a recovery map that jumps out, which is this rotated Pitts recovery map that we saw in Misha's talk. And so okay, this was maybe now a bit fast, everything, and the equations are a bit lengthy. But it's in some sense pretty clean because we only have one single inequality, which is really only this four matrix Golden Thompson inequality. So the first step is the definition. The second one is this variational formula. You could also define the relative entropy like that if you want. This step here is also just if you want the definition of the measured relative entropy. So everything that happens happens in this step. And this is really the Golden Thompson inequality for four matrices. OK, this is 
now also, so this is again what we now can show as a, as a corollary of, of this golden Thomson inequality. And this is now tied in the commutative case because this measured relative entropy um, simplifies to the relative entropy if everything is classical, then the measurement does not harm. And so, yes, so this, this then answers this question that was still open um, regarding these lower bounds on the conditional neutral information. Okay, with that, I think I would like to conclude. And thank you for your attention. Thanks. Questions? It, you didn't write the, uh, the measure in the pinching explicitly, but is it possible to maybe express some of the recovery maps as a pinching? As, as a pinching? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, this is possible. Um, like this, okay, this, this rotated, I mean, okay, the pinching has, okay, let me go back. So the pinching has this, oh, sorry, it's here. So the pinching has this representation that you can write it as, a, as an average over unitaries. And this recovery map that we always see is like a rotated Pates map, right? So it, it has some, some unitaries inside. And, um, okay, these unitaries come from the fact that you can also write the recovery map as a, as a pinched version of the Pates recovery map. But I think, um, usually to have some unitaries is a bit easier than to have like pinchings, but um, there exists also like pinched pits recovery maps that, that work well, but these are more or less the same as rotated pits recovery maps due to this, this representation. Um, can you comment something about, uh, uh, was it, what was it, complex interpolation theorem? Uh -huh. Yes, I could, yes. <laughs> okay, I have some slides that could maybe explain this a bit. So, okay, so, okay, this is, I think, the result that, or the, the theorem that we, that we use. This is so-called Stein-Hirschman interpolation theorem. And what does it tell us? It's, it's, uh, uh, fairly general result that relates norms. So it relates like holomorphic functions of, of norms with each other. So it, it's fairly general because it tells us that if you have like a strip on the complex plane, this set S here, and we have a holomorphic function that, um, on this strip that satisfies a few regularity conditions, then the following inequality holds. So we can somehow express the behavior of the, of the function in between zero and one, between the behavior, between how the function behaves on the boundary, right? So we can somehow, in, in, like the function inside this strip is controlled by how the function behaves at the extreme points or the, at the boundary of this strip. And then the whole magic in, or at least how I see it, the whole magic in how to use this kind of, of results is you need to have a clever choice or clever guess how you define this function, right? So therefore, I mentioned that the pinching, once you know exactly what you're looking for, you can read off what is probably a good choice of this function. So okay, if you can read it, you have lots of choice. You can choose the function, then you have lots of parameters here that you can choose for free. So it's, it's very general, and therefore, it's also pretty difficult to apply. But once you know exactly what you're looking for, you can probably come up with a good guess. And then this inequality, um, is basically then the golden Thompson inequality for just a specific choice of G. But it's not easy how you actually choose this function. So, um, but how did you find this good guess? I mean, I, I see that you probably have some insight, but uh, do, can you, do you have an uh, intuitive ex explanation of how you found this guess? Yes, this is because of the pinching, right? So the pinching, um, okay. So this was like the two matrix proof with pinching, right? This is, at least in my opinion, this is intuitive. And now if you would do the same, exactly the same proof by, with pinching in the iterative way, as I explained, then you know that this inequality here is true, right? 
And so we were just unhappy about the supremum. And all that the interpolation theorem does is it tells you that it's possible to remove the supremum and replace it with an average over this beta zero distribution. So this is all. And of course, if you have this inequality, then you know how this, or you can more or less guess what the function g looks like because it's given here and here, right? Uh, okay, I see. Okay. Have you tried? Hello. Ah, okay. So have have you tried? Um, seeing whether or not you could apply any of these results from pinching to problems in condensed matter physics, so especially, say, in infinite dimensions, where you can't just take the operator norm of the, the little individual local terms. Uh, yes, no, I didn't, didn't think. Start with finite dimension. Then. Yes, OK, this, this all only works for finite dimensions. Sure, but I imagine so, as long as you could, you could, you could uh, project into a finite subspace, right, mm -hmm. and then just take the limit carefully such that this additional term still goes to zero, right? The, the, the log poly mm -hmm. m over m. If you knew something about the spectrum, how it grows, I guess. You yes, could this, this could be, but okay. okay the but pinching you, is just, okay, one has to be very careful because this pinching inequality, right, has yeah. this normalization factor about one over the number of distinct eigenvalues. And if things are not finite, then, okay, things, sure. you, one has to be very careful. Yeah, no, no, I realize, I realize you'd have to be careful, but as long as you know something about the, the spectrum, how it grows. Yeah, yeah, then, then maybe mention. it's possible. Yes. Okay. But I, I, I just wondered, I was just curious, that's all. Okay. Mm. And let's thank David again.